property in the country. This is what they said on the International Day of Sexual Diversity. Many public institutions have raised the flag of cultural diversity, even in Congress, but I'm sure that not one of them offers concrete job inclusion plans for trans people. Because of these concerns, Alejandra Soto states, For us, this law is 30% of what we asked for. There is still 70% missing. Here, we don't have education, justice, health, and we don't even have access to a house. Trans men and women in this country are in a situation of poverty. And many of them have died, still searching for their name. And now let's go back to Mexico with our correspondent at the border, Alina Duarte, with more details about the migrants' hunger strike. Migrants have just held a press conference announcing that a group of women are going on hunger strike. They will march towards El Chaparral, which is one of the crossings between San Diego and Tijuana. There are over 6,000 migrants in a shelter in Tijuana, and authorities have announced that they will be moved to a bigger shelter that can house them all. The government of incoming president, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, has promised to give them food and shelter once he takes power. The incoming foreign minister has also added that aiding the migrants is not up for discussion. And the UN Human Rights Commission had asked the governments of U.S., Mexico, and Guatemala to respect the rights of migrants who are part of the caravan. A judge in Argentina has ruled that activist Santiago Maldonado was not the victim of a forced disappearance. The federal judge said Maldonado drowned in the Chubut River in August of last year. He also dismissed all accusations against the police. The judge closed the case against the policeman Emanuel Echazú, the only person accused of the disappearance. <clears throat> But the family of Santiago Maldonado put out a statement on social media after the ruling was announced. In it, the family says the judge in charge of the case had admitted to them that he was being blackmailed to acquit the police. The judge reportedly told them this just hours before he made the ruling. <laughs> And Southern Argentina world leaders have been arriving in Buenos Aires for the G20 summit set to take place on Friday and Saturday. But the city has already seen a series of intense protests and a number of security breaches. Many protesters are still outraged by President Mauricio Macri's massive loan deal with the International Monetary Fund. Other demonstrators are protesting the presence of leaders who've been engulfed in controversies, including Saudi Prince Mohammed bin Salman, Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto, and U.S. President Donald Trump. <clears throat> And ahead of his arrival to the meeting, President Trump has canceled his planned meeting with Russian Pre uh, President Vladimir Putin because of Russia's naval conflict with Ukraine. Trump was expected to meet the Russian president at the G20 summit, but on Twitter he said it would be best for all to cancel the meeting, as Russia has not released the Ukrainian ships it detained. And as world leaders descended on Buenos Aires, left-wing organizations have gathered outside Congress for the People's Summit. The main goal of this counter-summit is to condemn the leaders of the G20 and the International Monetary Fund. So far, sessions of the People's Summit have discussed politics, including feminism, LGBTQ rights, and youth policies. Participants are also speaking out against neoliberal trade policies from an anti-capitalist perspective. It's really easy to make decisions and plans without the participation of those who will truly feel the effects of those decisions. And that's the way things are done, to benefit only the few and not everyone. We need different types of exchange with the world. We need talks that benefit countries that are developing. We need the Mercosur. We need to have ties with Latin America, and that's not on the G20's agenda. Our correspondent Edgardo Esteban is at the People's Summit in the center of Buenos Aires. We are outside the National Congress. This is where the People's Summit is taking place, as an alternative to the G20. It is both a rejection of the presence of 20 of the world's most powerful leaders, but also a platform for the struggles of the people in this difficult situation that we are experiencing in our region. There are 16 different events taking place, including forums, debates and radio broadcasts, in the many tents that have been set up here in the square. 
and these are being organized by a range of organizations, trade unions, human rights bodies, and social movements. And all these will come together in a major demonstration on Friday afternoon, as part of this opposition to the G20 summit. However, Buenos Aires has been effectively militarized, with more than 22,000 troops virtually closing the city down, as well as 5,000 security personnel who came with the different leaders' delegations. That demonstration will go ahead. There is a public holiday and public transport has been banned from running, including trains, buses and the metro. Port traffic has also been suspended and most of the region's airports have been closed and taken over by the military. At the end of the day, the People's Summit is planning to release the document condemning the G20 and putting forward a people's alternative, including topics like economy, the environment, human rights, the state and society. A platform saying no to both the G20 and the International Monetary Fund. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. The Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. Monday, only on Telesur. Welcome back. Outgoing Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto has made a farewell video ahead of the swearing-in of Andrés Manuel López Obrador on Saturday. Peña Nieto's final act as president is the signing of the renegotiated U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, formerly the North American Free Trade Agreement. At the G20 summit, López Obrador takes office on Saturday, and on the same day, the official Los Pinos presidential residence will become a cultural center open to the public. Corruption scandals have engulfed the Peña Nieto administration. As the president's time in office comes to an end, let's take a look at some of the scandals that marred his administration. After six years in power, the popularity of outgoing President Enrique Peña Nieto has fallen to its lowest levels. The value of the currency has plummeted. There is corruption, murders. The murder rate is through the roof. If those in charge are corrupt, if the president is corrupt, then so will any policeman on the street. Corruption cases have been popping up one after the other. The most notorious had to be the one over the so-called White House, which came to light thanks to investigative journalism. What was meant to stay hidden is a home worth seven million US dollars, which was bought for President Pena Nieto and his wife. A contractor friend of theirs bought it, and he also received a lot of money that came from public funds through a call for bids for public works. Two years later, the shadow of the White House seemed to follow the president in an attempt to overcome that crisis. He asked for forgiveness from the people in a speech during the launch of the nation's anti-corruption system. I have felt the anger of the Mexican people in my own skin. I understand it. Therefore, with great humility, I ask forgiveness. I am sincerely sorry for the indignation I have caused. Despite his apology, though, governors from his own party continued to be embroiled in corruption scandals. Out of the 19 who took a picture with the president after his 2012 swearing-in, 10 ended up in jail or fleeing justice. Pre-governors were known as viceroys who could do as they pleased inside their states. There was constant misuse of public funds during the administration of Enrique Peña Nieto. According to a different media investigation, the government reportedly signed multi-million dollar contracts with shell companies. 
The government's image, no doubt, became even more tarnished after accusations surfaced against the former director of state oil company, Pemex, who allegedly received a $10 million bribe from the... ...going for a retrial. They say the court concealed dozens of pieces of vital evidence and protected those who ordered the killing. Eight men, including military officers, are accused of carrying out the murder of Cáceres in 2016. Protests continue in Ecuador as students demand their right to education, which is at risk in the country. Students are marching in the National Assembly, which is currently debating the 2019 budget. They are demanding that the administration comply with the Constitution and invest 0.5% of the GDP in education and health. The progressive increase hasn't appeared in the proposed budget, meaning education will receive $375 million less than in 2018 and healthcare will receive $194 million less. Moving on, Brazilian President-elect Jair Bolsonaro has appointed Luis Antonio Nagban Garcia, the leader of a far-right-wing farmers organization, to his cabinet. Garcia's organization protects the interests of landowners and has been accused of violent attacks on advocates for land reform, such as the landless workers' movement. And earlier in the day, Bolsonaro met with U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton in Rio de Janeiro. This is the first high-level meeting between the U.S. and the new Brazilian leader. The meeting was attended by Bolsonaro's future National Security Advisor and Defense Minister, both of whom come from an army background. Bolton said he is preparing the ground for a meeting between Bolsonaro and U.S. President Donald Trump. And the governor of Rio de Janeiro State, Luis Fernando Pesao, has been arrested on accusations of bribery in the Petrobras case. Pesao is accused of receiving bribes between 2007 and 2014 when he was vice governor under Sergio Cabral, who is currently in prison, accused of corruption. The police arrested eight others and searched 11 homes as part of the Lava Jato investigation. Our correspondent Brian Muir brings us more from Rio de Janeiro. At 7 a.m. this morning, a heavily armed motorcade arrived in front of the house of far-right Brazilian president-elect Jair Bolsonaro. In it was Donald Trump's security chief, John Bolton, who'd come to have breakfast with the future president and several members of his staff, including General Fernando Azevedo de Souza, who is going to be Bolsonaro's defense minister, Ernesto Araujo, who will be the Minister of Foreign Relations, and General Heleno, who's going to be Bolsonaro's Chief of Staff. Now, we don't know much about what they talked about yet, but according to posts made on Bolsonaro's social media, he said the meeting was prudent, and that John Bolton reminded him that Donald Trump was the first president to congratulate him on his electoral victory last month, and invited him to visit the White House in January. In other news, Rio de Janeiro Governor Luis Fernando Pezan was arrested by the federal police this morning for alleged involvement in a 150,000 hell a month bribery scheme during his tenure as vice governor under Sergio Cabral, who's also in jail right now on corruption charges. Now this makes it four governors in the history of Rio de Janeiro who have ended up in jail. Scotia Bank is defending its decision to exit some markets in the Caribbean. Senior Vice President Stephen Bagnaro says the Caribbean is integral to the bank's overall operations, and it is just a refocus on market skill. He adds that the bank will still be serving 90% of the Caribbean. Caribbean territories, including Grenada. In a 180-degree turn, Belize's Prime Minister Dean Barrow now says he will not step down from office. Back in January 2016, Barrow announced his intention to resign as government leader and head of the ruling party by January 2020. He had said he had no intention of sticking around after the results of next year's party leadership elections. However, a statement following Wednesday's cabinet meeting has expressed growing support for the ruling party. And in light of this, the Prime Minister has agreed to stay on. Which would have given his ear the experience necessary to...
Four firemen have been charged with theft after they stole items from the Fly Jamaica plane that crash landed at Guyana's airport this month. Fire officer Collis Williams is said to have stolen two mobile phones belonging to the captain of the Canada bound flight. The three other accused, Aubrey Frank, Jamie Kingston, and Royden Kennedy, allegedly received a quantity of stolen items from the aircraft, including laptops and jewelry. They will return to court on December 12th. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. A Labour member of the UK Parliament, Lloyd Russo Moyle, has announced on the floor of the House of Commons that he is HIV positive. He made the announcement during an adjournment debate for World AIDS Day, stating that he has been living with the HIV virus for 10 years. He said he hoped his public announcement will give courage and hope to those who have been diagnosed with the virus. Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn has hailed Moyle's announcement as courageous. Next year, I will be marking an anniversary of my own, 10 years since I became HIV positive. It has been a long journey from the fear of acceptance and today, hopefully, advocacy, knowing that my treatment keeps me healthy and protects any partner that I may have. After dismissing the genocide of Native Americans earlier in the week, Spanish Foreign Minister Joseph Borrell has been forced to backtrack. Borrell took to Twitter to explain comments he made about colonialism in North America, but stopped short of offering an apology. The former lawyer of the U.S. President Donald Trump has pleaded guilty to lying to Congress. In a, in a filling, prosecutors roll out a litany of lies Cohen admitted he told lawmakers about the project to build a Trump Tower in Moscow. Trump and his company had pursued the real estate project while he was running for election. Cohen's guilty plea is part of a new deal with special counsel Robert Mueller in the proof of Russia's interference in the 2016 election. And as the world marks the International Day of Solidarity with Palestine, both the PLO and a government spokesperson have called on the international community to remember and act on the Palestinian situation. A member of the PLO's executive committee says that solidarity is not only an abstract expression of empathy, but an active commitment. On November 29, 1947, the UN approved the resolution to create a Jewish state and an Arab one. Palestinian political prisoners Ahmad Sarati, who is 16-year-old, and Shadi Farah, who is 15, were released on the day after spending three years in prison for crimes they did not commit. They were greeted by Palestinian activist Ahed Tamimi, who was there to receive them. <laughs> These three years are the most difficult in my life, especially the first year. is the most difficult time in being in jail. I was a child, and I didn't know about the situation of being in jail. I faced a lot of problems in the beginning of my arrest, especially the interrogation. Mostly they're trying to brainwash us, and they gave us medicine. The verbal abuse and the beatings. They beat Ahmed one day until we thought he was going to die. They beat me in the Russian compound. I was taking a bath, and I was washing my clothes. I was naked, and they kept me in the cold with the air conditioning on, until I was so cold for over six hours. The military who takes the prisoners to and from the jail treat prisoners very bad. 
Our correspondent in the Middle East, Nayira Tardo, gives us more details. Palestine's resistance movement Hamas has condemned the support of the United States for Israel through a letter sent to the United Nations. The chief of political direction of Hamas condemned the U.S. proposal to name Hamas as a terrorist group. The United States is expected to present a document before the United Nations Assembly on Friday, if not on Monday, condemning the launch of strikes against Israel. Just last June, the United States had already proposed a similar document before the UN, which was not approved by the Security Council. Hamas's political chief also condemned the Israeli occupation of Palestine, the constant attacks on places which are sacred to Muslims in Jerusalem, and the demolition of Palestinian villages. A letter with these complaints was sent to the UN on the International Day of Solidarity with Palestine. The Day of Solidarity is celebrated each 29th of November. This year, the celebration comes at a critical moment when conflicts and uncertainties surround Palestine, especially related to the peace process and the deterioration of humanitarian and economic conditions in the Gaza Strip after attacks by Israel and confrontations between Hamas and the Israeli army. We thank Nayara for that report. Jamaica's very own reggae music has secured a spot on the United Nations list of global cultural treasures. UNESCO added to the gender to its collection of intangible cultural her heritage deemed worthy of protection. UNESCO says reggae's contribution to international discourse can't be ignored. <laughs> The news was received with celebrations and UNESCO officials sang along to the Marley classic One Love. And now we invite you all to sing this song. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also join us on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching. Para mantenerme saludable, yo corro. To keep myself healthy, I study. Y en la dieta de Luis, trato de sustar. 
mantenerme saludable, yo bailo. Para mantenerme saludable, yo purifico mi espíritu a través del cuerpo. ¿Y tú? Get your body. Tuesdays, only on LSU. Watching Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo, and these are the headlines at this hour. A group of women from the migrant caravan in Tijuana, Mexico, have announced they are going on hunger strike. They are demanding that humanitarian visas be provided so that they can enter the United States. With at least 10 women taking part, the strikers will install themselves at the Chaparral crossing and rotate with 25 other members of the caravan. I want to communicate that we, the women, are going on a hunger strike. We didn't want to do this in the dark, so we are making an announcement in this press conference. A Chilean court has issued an arrest warrant for four police officers who took part in the operation that killed Mapuche Camilo Catrillanca on November 14th. The officers will be taken into custody for homicide, attempted murder, and obstruction of justice. A report from the Operational Intelligence of